Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Moser. I am professor of history and chair of the Master of Arts in American History and Government program at Ashland University. Welcome to another episode of Documents in Detail, Teaching American History's webinar series in which we bring together thoughtful scholars to have a conversation about historically significant documents. We encourage all of you joining us today to participate in that conversation by submitting questions via the text, via the chat box. And please do send those questions to all of us so that they don't get missed. Uh, we'll try to get to as many of those questions as possible. Within the next week, all of you out there will receive an email with a link to, to request a certificate of participation, as well as a link to the archived video and audio from today's program, which we hope you will share with your friends via social media. The speeches, letters, and other writings that we're using all of this year's webinars are drawn from our book, 50 Core American Documents. They're also available at the Ashbrook Center's voluminous document database located at tah.org. The subject of today's program is Lyndon Baines Johnson's 1964 commencement address at the University of Michigan, better known as the Great Society Speech. And to help discuss it this evening are Dr. Gregory Schneider, Professor of History at Emporia State University, and Dr. Abby Lynn Sellers, Associate Professor of Politics at Azusa Pacific University. Welcome to both of you. So my uh, stock opening question for these, uh, tell me what is the, why is this document so significant? Why does it deserve to be included among 50 core American documents? I'll, I'll take a stand at that first. I think it, it's actually Lyndon Johnson's most beautiful speech. Um, it's well, Britain. It's it's kind of got the optimism, I think, of early 60s liberalism. Um, it's filled with, it's kind of a mix of FDR. Uh, sometimes I see his Commonwealth Club speech, which is one of his great speeches that's in the 50 core documents as well, uh, as well as the mixture, I think, of just the the great expectations that liberals had for using government to solve social problems. Uh, it's the high point, of course, of that phenomenon in the post-war world and one brimming i think with with great kind of illusions to um what we as americans can do when we set our mind to it but of course using the government to solve the social problems and when you compare it with reagan's time for choosing speech which is also on the list uh, of speeches to read it's the exact opposite it's it's you know poking fun at this expectation that government can cure and solve all social problems so i think in, in many respects it's the the peak of the grand expectations, as Thomas Patterson has called them, of these expectations about li what liberals liberals could do uh, to solve social problems, and we've come we've mm. kind of gone a long way from that, of course, in yeah. our in our politics. Abby Lynn, what do you care to add to that? Yeah, um, I, I think that it's important because it really is one of the most ambitious declarations by a U.S. president to use the powers of the American government to seek to affect social change. And um, it created a number of federal programs and departments that still exist to this day and really recast the understanding of, of what government is and its ends in terms of altering the relationship between the governed uh, and the government itself. And so um, it, it really, as Greg was saying, kind of focuses on this idealism, uh, kind of criticizing the status quo and uh, think about it, it really Johnson was challenging the challenge of eliminating poverty in America was kind of set uh, in this confidence of government that government had the sufficient resources to do so, uh, kind of similar to that end of sending a man to the moon. Um, and so we really believe that both of these tasks could be engineered by a competent government, uh, really with the sufficient resources that it had. And so Johnson uh, was offering uh, to America what America might be able to accomplish uh, with this speech and really uh, set forth this understanding of, like I said, the, the role of the federal government, state government's community, uh, but also, you know, what the citizen could do as well. Okay. But this sense of, of, uh, of perhaps even overweening confidence 
just kind of seems alien in our in uh, in 2019. Um, can you each give us some sense for the historical context? What is the source of this uh, of this 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 brimming confidence? Well, I mean, I think it's a reflection of um, Johnson's own sense of what he saw as important for government to achieve. I mean, Johnson himself, as I'm sure most of the listeners know, was a child of poverty. He understood what poverty was. Um, he understood what had the difficulties of his mother uh, hauling water uh, because they didn't have electricity uh, to cook with. Uh, his father, kind of a politician, but not very successful, at least not very corrupt, I guess, it's the way Lyndon Johnson might have been in raising his money. And Johnson served as a new dealer. He backed FDR, especially, cer certainly it helped his political career. And he was a deal maker too. I mean, what, what I think Abby Lynn said something interesting that I don't think there's anything about Johnson saying what m we might accomplish. We will accomplish this. I mean, we will build the great society. We will fight and win a war against poverty. I mean, we'll destroy poverty in a generation or less. Johnson's promising these kind of lofty expectations which fit very well, I think, in the sensibility of early 60s America. The economy was growing. Um, we were still riding high in the kind of post-war boom. Vietnam had not yet become you know, the war it would become. We were edging there slowly towards 64, but not at this point. Uh, this is a few months before Tonkin Gulf, uh, and certainly almost a year before we send combat troops in. So, I mean, the, the expectations are high. And Abby Lynn said going to the moon was was part of that too for JFK, right? And and that we'll get there within a within a decade's time, and we do. And these are things that lead to, I think, the sense that we can do anything if we set our minds to it. Which which Johnson's political career seems to brim with, mm -hmm. even even fighting communism in Vietnam, of course. Abby Lynn. Yeah. Um, in contrast to the New Deal, the New Deal was implemented to solve an economic crisis, whereas the Great Society, we were in a time of uh, affluence and economic prosperity. Um, and so it really created this assumption that uh, affluence could be this kind of permanent fixture uh, of our economic landscape, and we needed to take advantage of that. And, you know, Kennedy, obviously, after his assassination, Johnson sought to push forward and for Kennedy stalled uh, pieces of legislation, specifically civil rights um, and the, the tax cut. Uh, but Johnson himself wanted to separate himself. He wasn't part of the, the East Coast establishment. He was a Texan and he wanted to be remembered as a great president. And so being able to focus on a, a program and a project uh, that could be his, uh, the Great Society definitely was that. And so it was his opportunity to try to establish himself uh, as a great president. I think there, there's a sense that LBJ wanted to outdo FDR too, that FDR went, went um, maybe halfway there and Johnson was going to solve the rest and do it bigger and better than, than even FDR did. And the great question is, was it really needed? I mean, isn't this the debate about the war on poverty? How much how much poverty was so, was solved by government intervention, and how much poverty was so so was solved by a growing economy, which was which was occurring in the '60s? I mean, the economy was growing at six percent a year uh, in the mid '60s. So this was not, you know, uh, as Abby Lynn said, the Great Depression by any means. Yeah. So uh, I mean, I imagine the the, the... Poverty rate had had dropped considerably just in the last the, the five years previous to this speech. Yes. Okay. Um, so let's look more at this at, at the speech. For, for one thing, it's it's a rare thing when presidents write their own speeches, and I'm assuming that Johnson was not the author of this. Uh, do you know who wrote it? I think it was Richard Goodwin. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Um, why great society? Where did that where did that term come from? That I'm not sure. Do you know Abby Lynn? No, I, I don't. Well, um, is there any significance to the fact that this speech was given at the University of Michigan? Well, he's in he's enjoining youth, of course, um, mm -hmm. to join him in this. I mean, the last the last page of the speech goes on and on about, will you join me? And, 
And when you watch it on YouTube, um, you know, Johnson's not the greatest speech giver in the world. Um, so you can, you can, will you join me? And he kind of leans in and he says, will you join me in building this great society? And uh, I don't know how many youth, young people he convinced versus uh, JFK, who was certainly of the same perspective and encouraging young people to ask not what you can do, what you, your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. I mean, but Johnson is certainly appealing to young people um, to build the great society. I mean, these are the people who are going to be the, the leaders of the up and coming generation. And he's certainly appealing to those people to, to take on the task. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the, at the very beginning, he says, your imagination, your initiative, and your indignation will determine whether we build a society where progress is the servant of our needs or a society where our values and new visions are buried under unbridled growth. So with this, he, he's kind of putting, putting it on them that this is your opportunity and your chance uh, to, to do something, uh, which you know, most commencement speeches seek to be inspiring just finished four years of education so now go out and do something with it so he's trying to instill in them uh, kind of just you know go, go do something and and this is what you can do uh, mm -hmm. this great experiment in the great society and, and really that's kind of what's bad because uh, they hadn't been done at this scale prior to this time the new deal created one social program uh, specifically in the 1935 Social Security Act, Social Security, uh, focusing on workers' retirement and disability, uh, aid to abandoned uh, children and orphans. But this, this is going to attack all areas of poverty uh, in, in, in its entirety, in a way. And so that's quite a, a broad goal yeah. for college graduates to go, go, go do it. Yeah, it's, an, yeah. it's one, one of us. One of the keys to the great society is education, of course, and higher education is going to be expanded. Obviously, student loan programs will be expanded, uh, vocational training, um, K through 12 education with the elementary and secondary education acts. I mean, it's a perfect setting to to raise these very ideas. And again, FDR gave a speech at Oglethorpe University in 1932 on the campaign trail a few months before the Commonwealth Club address. And he's basically saying we, we have too many teachers and there's not enough jobs. And this is a very different context where Johnson's saying, you know, he'd say some similar, we have too many teachers who are poorly paid and we have some good teachers who, well, we have good teachers who are poorly paid and we don't have enough good teachers uh, in, in marginal situations. I mean, he's calling for these young people to take a service role in a way, whereas Roosevelt 30 years earlier is kind of calling on them to say, you know, you're going to graduate and have a difficult time in this economy. I mean, it's a different mark, mark different thing, and the government's going to come in and aid education now, um, unlike before the federal government, I should say. I, I, I certainly see the uh, rhetorical flourishes in this speech that harken back to uh, JFK's inaugural, the trying to trying to work the students into some kind of a chant, which uh, you know I don't know how successful he he, he was not. I, I have not seen the video. But I'm wondering if there isn't some significance to the fact that this is, uh, it's not just any university, it's, it's a major Midwestern land grant university. Uh, it's not, he's not in an Ivy League school, for, uh, for example. What do you think about that? Well, he's appealing to the, the common person. So you don't have to be an Ivy Leaguer. You're just a norm, normal person, a normal citizen can enact change. They just have to have the, the will and the desire to do so. And so I think that was part of the appeal is that you as a normal citizen, uh, you, you, can, you can do this. Yeah, he, he even makes a little joke about uh, if I were here tonight, I'd see students living the good life, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, who was the in inspiration for all of this? I mean, I, obviously LBJ was a man of of liberal principles going way back, but 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 uh, who are the architects of these of these ideas and these programs? I mean, I think when he gets, I mean, he he is. I mean, in many respects, I think this is Johnson's um, sense. Um, Johnson, who realized that as somebody who came from very modest means, um, poor, raised poor, didn't have a lot of money. 
uh, was able to, to achieve a college education at uh, the Teachers College in Southern Texas. Uh, education to him was a ticket to opportunity. You certainly have that in the civil rights at, uh, movement at that time, that education is going to be the ticket out of uh, inequality um, on the cusp of you know, black power, which kind of changes that focus, but not yet. Um, you know, these are kind of ideas that have been swirling around in the liberal orbit for some time, and the government has to support those sorts of things. Uh, Johnson understood what poverty was. He, 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 I think he said at one time that, you know, Kennedy's Appalachian Redevelopment Act and some of the other things that the Kennedy administration, they're the ones who stick with the war on poverty, but Johnson continues it, as he says in a speech after Kennedy's death. So I think a lot of the ideas for improving, you know, educational opportunities, the damaged cities and other things are swirling around in the liberal kind of um, intellectual orbit. We have Michael Harrington's The Other America, which is a huge influence on it. Uh, Rachel Carson's Silent Spring to a degree, which is a big influence on environmental activism. And I think these things also are important to Johnson, who sees these as very much connected to the type of society that government could build. Mm -hmm. Abby Lynn, anything to add? Uh, yeah, so I, I think I'll just go back to, again, his presidency and him wanting to be remembered for something. And he, he did have the political skills to move legislation along and to persuade and pressure legislators uh, to implement um, these ideas. And so, and obviously he didn't do it by himself. He gathered a number of experts and scholars uh, created a number of forces uh, to set this legislative agenda, but he, he knew how to do this uh, politically. And I think that that's something that's important to note as well in terms of how he was able to get this push through uh, after the election in which he defeated Goldwater. I mean, he, he had a two thirds majority Democratic Congress uh, to Democratic Congress to help implement and pass this legislation. And so I think the, the political savviness, knowing that he actually probably could, uh, was a big part of that too. Mm -hmm. um, I think the, the country was liberal too, right? So the country is, you know, we're still in the kind of the New Deal political coalition is still dominant. Labor unions are still important to this coalition. White working class voters are still important to this coalition. He appeals to the sense that um, this will produce a society in where people will have abundance, people have liberty, people will have the ability to do the great things they've always wanted to do, you know, to have a beautiful place to do it, if you clean up the cities and the environment and provide for people. I mean, that's, that's a very powerful argument in 1964. It'd be a very, it's a more difficult argument to make 20 years later, you know, during the Reagan era, the government's going to provide for this for you. And even today, it'd probably be a difficult thing to do. I mean, think of President Obama's run for the presidency in 2008. He's not talking in these terms the way Johnson is, even though arguably he's the most liberal president elected since Johnson in, in a large way for the, on the Democratic side, meaning that he's willing to use government more aggressively than, than Bill Clinton and uh, Jimmy Carter had been. Mm -hmm. This makes me ask about how Johnson fits in with what might be called the progressive tradition. And, and one thing that struck me about how this speech is different from your average FDR speech, or even a, even a, 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 a Teddy Roosevelt or Wilson speech is, there aren't any bad guys here. Uh, there are bad things that have to be overcome, but one gets a sense from looking at this that all of these things can be accomplished without pain. I mean, it's it, it's an effort, of course, but but it's you know we're not we're we're not in the situation we're in because of bad people who have to be punished. You comment on that? I think, you, especially when you compare it to like Roosevelt's rhetoric. Well, I mean, even the Commonwealth Club address goes through this long litany of, you know, the Industrial Revolution and the evil insoles and. Um, who are responsible for bringing about the depression, but Re Roosevelt turns up the rhetoric against businessmen and against the capitalists in 1935, 36, 37, uh, much to his chagrin, uh, and then has to accommodate with them during World War II in order to win the war uh, in many ways. 
Yeah, I don't think there's any, there's no sense of villainy here. He's not blaming anybody. He's not castigating anybody. In that way, that would probably have a greater appeal to young people who he's speaking to than to um, any other group because he's not looking at enemies. And I think if you really think about the way he had approached Vietnam, it's the same way. I mean, he, he kind of doesn't really use, you know, he never gives a speech like this on Vietnam, for instance, which was much to the problem of, I think, Johnson trying to explain why we're there, what the war's about. He never really does that. And I think that's the big problem he faces with public opinion once it starts to go bad and goes bad very quickly by 66. So John and Johnson's torn about this. But I think that Johnson is that if you if you can't if you who would he blame for anything at this point? The economy is going gangbusters. Businesses, you know, this kind of accommodation between business and government, between labor and management is partially responsible for this. We don't have the international competition yet. It's on the cusp of that coming from Japan and the common market that we had in the 1970s. So who do you blame? I mean, that's that might be the selling point. You don't have to blame anybody. We have all of these problems. Let's overcome them. Hmm. I'll do it. Yeah, and I think also he brings up a, a really important question that had not fully been addressed before in terms of poverty. Is poverty the result of circumstances or is it the result of victimization? And so he, he brings that kind of forward in this. Uh, and then of course, scholars like picking up on this and, and writing, well, which is it? Is it one or the other? Uh, but I think that that was an important question um, that he talks about specifically in a special special message to Congress where he proposes uh, the great, you know, the war on poverty and how we're going to have this objective of this total victory on this. Um, but um, so he really wanted to focus on striking at the causes, not just the consequences of poverty. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously with the programs uh, from the Great Society that was going to address that. I guess if you have to say anything, the enemy is poverty, and who yeah. could be against doing something to help poor people? That appeals to American sense of justice, fair play, the spiritual side of, you know, Jesus addressed this about helping the poor. The enemy is inequality, um, and certainly the civil rights movement had to overcome inequality in order to get to that point. But again, who could be against in a, who could be against inequality? Who could be for inequality? I mean, it's very difficult. These are not enemies that are, you know, as easy to castigate, but they're easy to to draw. I think people around and say we have to fight against these sorts of things and injustice. Uh, nothing in this speech seems more out of step with the progressive tradition than the call for tax cuts. <laughs> I mean, that was FDR's rhetoric calling for raising taxes certainly on the wealthy. So it was Teddy Roosevelt's and, uh, and, and Woodrow, uh, Woodrow Wilson's. Why were tax cuts so important to uh, Johnson? Well, Abby, Lynn, you want to go first? I think, uh, yeah, um, it was obviously something that was in the pipeline already from the Kennedy administration. And Johnson felt that it was very important to push forward uh, a number of Kennedy's initiatives uh, after he was assassinated and that was already in the pipeline. It wasn't one of the things that were kind of doomed. Um, and so he really felt that in terms of, we've got to carry on Kennedy's legacy. So this is just a, a simple explanation uh, to push that through because it was already in motion. Well, I'm going to a more thorough explanation than that. Mm -hmm. So this was- yeah, when, he gives, when he gives a speech, let us continue after Kennedy these death tax cuts are the first thing he mentions and then the second yeah. is civil rights and the third is poverty i think or the war in poverty so mm -hmm. i mean yeah those are kennedy products he, he's not he gets it passed in 1964 but then he doesn't do another thing about tax cuts again i mean this is not johnson's issue uh it's inherited from Kennedy, and there's a great debate whether it was the first supply side tax cut that, that's come out recently um you know, in the same sense that Reagan and later Bush's were. Um, I mean, that's not Johnson's issue. So he gets it passed, but that's all he does with it. He never brings up tax cuts again in the rest of his president. And he, he's faced with the prospect of having to raise taxes in order to pay for the war, which is something he doesn't want to do. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I, eventually I want to I want to talk about the relationship between the Great Society and the war. But but before we before we do that, civil rights it, it, it gets mentioned in this speech, but it's certainly not front and center. This is not fundamentally a, a civil rights speech. How does civil rights connect to the uh, to the Great Society? Certainly, civil, the Civil Rights Act at the time is in the hopper. Um, by April of 64, he signs it in June, doesn't he? I think it's still being filibustered, I believe, in the Senate, uh, if I'm not mistaken, um, where they just broke the filibuster, so it's coming to a vote soon, mm -hmm. I believe. So, I mean, in essence, he's appealing, you know, he, where is he speaking? I'm sure the University of Michigan graduating class was probably 98% white. Um, so you, so if you're appealing, I mean, and most of them would probably, most of the young people there would probably have been very sympathetic to the civil rights movement. He could have given a civil rights speech if he wanted to, but that's a campaign address. I mean, he's running for election on his own. Civil rights is a crucial part of what the Great Society is all about, but um, it's already being addressed. So why talk about it when you can talk about these other goals that are really issues about the election? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Have you lived? Yeah, I agree about it being a, a campaign issue, but also, again, a, a carryover from the Kennedy administration that was kind of more on, on the doomed list, but... Uh, really, the passage of that and then the Voting Rights Act of 65 really kind of paved the way for Johnson to uh, do his Great Society initiatives. And so he had to get those through first uh, in order to set it up to push forward all these social programs, creating new federal agencies and other social projects. So it's, again, I see it as him attempting to help the country heal in a way uh, and carry forward Kennedy's agenda. Of course, we know that the Kennedys were not great fans of Johnson, uh, that, that, that JFK just saw him as useful in bringing the South along, but, but didn't, have, didn't have much use for him. Uh, Bobby Kennedy uh, hated his guts. How much of this was LBJ trying to show that how he could succeed where Kennedy failed. I think it's just LBJ's bigger than life sense of himself as a politician who will deliver. So, I mean, partly, I guess it's that, John, in the sense that, you know, that the Kennedys started the war on poverty, I'm going to finish it. Um, the Kennedys started the tax cut, I'm going to finish it. The Kennedys started civil rights, I'm going to finish it. Um, certainly, arguably, you can say on civil rights, if Kennedy had lived, the Civil Rights Act might not have been passed in 1964 because Kennedy didn't have the legislative wherewithal to get the bill through, whereas Johnson used all of his uh, personal power to, to lobby senators and congressmen to push them and then working with Everett Dirksen, the Republican minority leader, to get Republican votes lined up so that they could break the filibuster and get the votes to, to pass the bill. Um, Kennedy lacked that kind of legislative ability, that brokering that made Johnson, as Cairo called him, the master of the Senate. Um, I mean, certainly he was an incredibly impressive politician. There's no doubt about it. He could, he could push people to his will. But it's his will. I mean, I think maybe the maybe if you look at that war on poverty speech and say Johnson is following up on what Kennedy started, and you could use that argument and say, yes, this is probably Johnson trying to say, I'm going to do better than that little squirt that I replaced in office, which Johnson never much liked either, of course. But the um, Great Society is his and his alone. Kennedy never proposed anything this ambitious. Kennedy was rather conservative on on social and domestic policies in certain ways. And so Johnson's uh, creating his own kind of sense of what liberalism will be under his watch. Mm. Um, the, uh, we talked some about the, the uh, educational, the role of education in this, which is no surprising given Johnson's background. Uh, the other two main areas that he mentions are urban renewal and uh, and the environment. What makes him focus on those things? Uh, 
I think the cities, especially, I mean, we're not yet at the crisis point of the environment by the late 60s. Where the, is the Cuyahoga River on fire yet? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Is Lake Erie dead yet? Um, is, you know, the Hudson River dead yet? I mean, all of this stuff kind of starts to happen in this era. I mean, you have a, almost a century of industrialization, you know, playing a role in destroying, uh, diminishing the environment. Uh, he, he talks about in terms of, you know, we need, we have too much traffic interesting kind of thing so you know one of his great creations is the department of transportation which people wanted and certain transportation policies like public transit which was really produced by johnson and the democratic congress uh mm -hmm. in a large way uh the building of the dc metro which was one of the great accomplishments mm -hmm. of the great society for instance all of these sorts of things are products of they they tie together i mean they beautify the cities they make it livable so when he says you know um, on page two of the document, the Great Society is a place where every child can, enlarge, can find knowledge to enrich his mind to enlarge his power. It's a place where leisure is a welcome chance to build and reflect. It's not a feared cause of boredom and restlessness. It is a place where the city of man, son of Augustine, serves not only the needs of the body and the demands of commerce, but the desire for beauty and the hunger for community. I mean, that's beautiful language. So Goodwin deserves an A plus for writing it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's too bad Johnson's delivering it because he's not the best deliverer. But nevertheless, it's, it's a gorgeous sentimentality of what you know we can build, we can produce cities. So I, I maybe goes back to like the city beautiful movement of the progressive era. You know, building cities that are livable places that will inspire um, both commerce and culture will help the poor and help others uh, to have an enjoyable place to live. And of course, the opposite is true in most cities by the 1960s. Tenement uh, housing, slums, all the other problems that cities are faced with, pollution. How do you mean? Yeah, uh, echoing what uh, Greg said in terms of the, the slums, the Department of Housing and Urban Development was created as part of yeah. the Great Society. So how do you lift people who are living in these slums out of poverty? Well, we can give them housing, affordable housing, uh, offer it for prior to that, that didn't exist. So it was, you know, this start of, you have to go locally uh, where these problems are. And uh, it went to, we had a, a model cities kind of agenda, how to revitalize them. Uh, because if you start there, then that's going to uh, make a, a better environment for people to live and uh, help lift people out of poverty, create jobs. Um, but uh, it really, the focus of it in terms of giving this handout to people, a means of way that the federal government could be involved. But what's interesting is he talks about in his speech uh, about this new federalism um, or creative federalism, uh, saying that the solution to these problems is not rest on a massive program in Washington, nor can it rely solely on the strained resources of local authority. They require us to create new concepts of cooperation, a creative federalism between the national capital and the leaders of local communities. So he had a claim that this was not just going to be some massive you know, mandate from the federal government down, that it required the, the cooperation uh, of these local governments uh, in order to where it's happening right? so to implement these things but it, it is interesting to to question and ask well, did this really happen was this realistic uh, could these yeah. governments really do this yeah we saw that in his in his uh speech declaring on poverty too right the office of economic uh, opportunity it's going to coordinate things at the top but the solutions are going to bubble up from from below and then get funding funding from the top. Yeah, it's interesting how he 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 really wants to make an effort to show that this is not going to be Washington D.C. just calling all the uh, calling all the shots. But John, I think in that sense too, he's arguing you know for his community action programs and that it's poor people themselves, the citizens who themselves who are going to solve the social problems that face them. So in a, in a weird way, it's almost like he's channeling Students for a Democratic Society's Port Huron statement about participatory democracy in a way. I, I doubt mm. Lyndon Johnson knew anything about 
SDS's Port Huron statement, maybe one of his speechwriters did. But I mean, it's very, caps are very much in that vein where you're going to get the poor people of cities to solve their social problems. The problem is the poor people have been so disconnected from politics, they don't know anything about how to work the system. And so eventually, you know, as uh, the trouble comes for the Great Society, SDS becomes very active in cities in the early 60s, something called the Educational Research and Action Project. There's only 400 of them because who wants to spend their summer vacation away from the University of Michigan living on peanut butter and crackers and helping poor people put up a street light uh, or a stoplight at the intersection by a school. I mean, that's kind of things that they're focused on. And then the Black Panther Party in the mid 60s uses great society funds to fund free breakfast clinics and sickle cell anemia tests, but also to purchase guns uh, in Oakland and other places. I mean, this becomes part of the problem that Johnson faces in the in the kind of crack up that that brings to the liberal coalition of this of the New Deal. Yeah, uh, let's uh, yeah let's talk about. Um, I do want to talk about the the legacy of the Great Society and and to what extent it it succeeded or failed, but um, focusing for the moment on this speech, how was it received? Well, obviously, well, since he won a landslide election. <laughs> I mean, I don't know about this particular speech. Like I said, I think it's one of his his greatest speeches rhetorically. Um, the fact is, is that Johnson is running. This is what you're going to get if you support Lyndon Johnson and the Civil Rights Act passes. And so that's a claim that he can take to the bank when it comes to the election. Um, the Great Society is the program that he's running on. Um, and then the Republicans nominate Barry Goldwater, the antithesis of the Great Society in a sense. You know, the first real conservative to come through the ranks of a, what you could call a conservative movement who wins the nomination. But he's no Reagan. And so he has a difficult time selling his ideas about individualism and liberty in opposition to Johnson's Great Society program. And so it, it, I don't, particularly the speech is Obviously, it's in the 50 great documents, so it has to be received pretty well. Um, that's one way to put it. But it's also, I think, in some respects, it does set the expectations for what the country can do, as you said, if it sets its mind to it. Hmm. I, I, I guess, and Abby, that I want to give you a chance to chime in on this as well. But I, I'm wondering to what extent. Johnson's resounding electoral victory in 1964 is a result of Johnson's agenda or the fact that Goldwater just seems like he's way off on the fringe, right? In, in, in a way, you could argue in 1964 that Johnson is the conservative candidate because he is the custodian of, of not just of his own ideas, but he's the custodian of the New Deal. Mm -hmm. As Goldwater's out there saying, I want to privatize Social Security and, 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 and really roll back these things. What do you, what do you, I'd like to hear what you both think about that. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I, I would think that Goldwater was considered, well, they painted him as such an extremist. Um, so it's, I, I don't know. I, I haven't looked at like polling or anything specifically from that period, but I think that because he was, Goldwater was depicted as such an extreme, well, you know, with the Daisy ad and he's gonna, you know, we're gonna go into nuclear destruction if you elect him as president. And so I think the the fear of potentially having him versus Johnson who had already been in office and had carried the country through this great tragedy, um, JFK's assassination. Um, I think a lot of it was the the depiction of, of Goldwater is just one who would uh, destroy America, more or less if elected into office. But I think there was a lot of optimism and idealism with the great society rhetoric uh, that had been sold to the American public. Yeah, it's the first, the first conservative election in a sense that a conservative slash libertarian as Goldwater can be seen wins the major party nomination. So, I mean, 
you can say there were conservative nominees before, but this is the product of the movement now. Goldwater is kind of in the front of that politically. His book, Conscience of a Conservative in 1960, excites young people, leads the formation of groups like Young Americans for Freedom on campus, which Michigan had a chapter of. I don't know if any of them were in attendance for the Great Society speech, probably. But it's nothing like the campus, you know, the campus activism today. Um, which is well organized and kind of well funded. These are these are young people trying to fight for conservative values, most of which are shaped by Goldwater, in a sense that he's in favor of uh, limited government, in favor of victory over communism, which Reagan talks about in his time for choosing speech. Um, but Goldwater is a bad bad candidate to present those ideas. He's crabby. He knows he's not going to win. There's no way that the American people are going to go from Kennedy to Johnson to Goldwater in a year's time. And any Republican running would have faced that same problem, whether it was um, Nelson Rockefeller, who was impossible to nominate because he just divorced his wife and married a young woman uh, who left her young children to be with him. Uh, and or William Scranton, who was governor of Pennsylvania, or George Romney, governor of Michigan. I mean, all of these people had no chance against Johnson. Yeah. I don't even know if it would have been closer if they would have been the nominee. I think we're, we're, at, we're at the fringe of the breaking apart of the liberal coalition, which the 60s brings to bear, and it's Vietnam that plays a role in it, but it's also the great society too, and it's endorsement of entitlement, which replaces opportunity eventually with the uh, constructs of liberalism. And I think it's also the fracturing of the youth culture too, with the anti-Vietnam War movement and the counterculture three years away, but all of this coming at once is blamed on liberals unfairly, but ultimately this is, this is who's in power and this is who bears the blame for it. And it's Johnson who gets us involved in Vietnam at the same time he wants to fight a war in poverty. And Goldwater, you know, just is an awful candidate. He's he says we're going to privatize Social Security, but there's no study on this. There's no policy behind it. He says we're going to privatize the TV, TVA and Tennessee. You know, he's crabby. He's a curmudgeon. He doesn't even want to campaign half the time. Um, the speech he gives, extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. I mean, coming a few months after an extremist killed the president. I mean, not mm. exactly the greatest choice of words uh, to use. I mean, so in that sense, he binds himself with these extremist elements in 1964, which come to be under the shepherding of Ronald Reagan and others, the basis for conservative victories later. My favorite Goldwater story. Uh, it comes out of Rick Perlman's uh, Rick Perlman's book, which which I recommend to you. I mean, Perlman has his hobby horses, but 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 this is a it's a beautifully written book mm -hmm. uh, about the 1964 campaign. Uh, some soda manufacturer produced a uh, a soda called Goldwater, and uh, Goldwater makes a campaign stop where this where where this this place is based. Somebody sticks a can of it in his hand. They're rolling. He takes a sip of it. He says, "This stuff tastes like piss." <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah, that's what a cold water. Yeah, I want to press on something you said before the, the transition from the theme of opportunity to entitlement. I'm wondering if that's something you both might might say a bit about a legacy of the of, of the Great Society. Abby Lynn, you want to start? Sure. It was. Um... Definitely the establishment of these social programs that the government, it was the government's responsibility to provide for the have nots and the creation of you know, Medicare, Medicaid, Head Start, food stamps uh, was a product of the Great Society. So it was really this, this shift of uh, the government should provide this safety net. Now, FDR, back during the New Deal, understood that welfare, I believe he called it a, a cancer, um, that it was not healthy and it was not good for people to become dependent upon this type of giving or welfare. But the Great Society really shifted uh, by creating all of these programs, the notion of what the government's responsibility is in terms of providing uh, this safety net. And so the safety net only continued to expand and grow uh, following the Great Society. 
society until welfare reform in 1996, uh, where it started a little before that in terms of realizing that we can't continue to give out entitlements uh, without having these recipients do something in return for it, such as work. Um, but really the great society can be pinpointed to it, establishing entitlement uh, patriarchal programming that the government is going to provide. And so the net over time turned into this, it was probably an unintended consequence, this hammock uh, where mm. people could indefinitely stay on welfare, no time limits, uh, no requirements really to get off. You just had to fall off. Um, mm. so, so that- And Reagan, Reagan amazingly <laughs> diagnoses it right away. I mean, he says, you know, the Great Society has all these job training programs. Um, we're going to put people back. I mean, Johnson alludes to the fact in the War on Poverty speech that we're going to put people back to work in CCC-like camps, which is very, very much a part of what his goal was. And Reagan says we're spending, you know, one third, what, 37 percent of um, taxes are spent on, you know, the well, Great Society welfare programs that's eating up the federal budget. Um, I mean, this is very, this is the start of this conservative argument, which lasts in some respects up until recently. I don't see, you know, Trump as a budget cutter, but certainly the idea is that um, you have to rein in federal spending, especially when it goes to people who are unproductive, becomes a constant kind of trope of the conservative movement after this time. And Reagan sees this as early as 1964. Um, and we're, we're still not really into the great society yet. We're just into the war on poverty. Um, that, those programs have been passed, but not the rest of them, not the things that Abby Lynn is talking about, you know, expansion of AFDC programs and food stamps and the housing uh, subsidies and all the other things that, um, that Johnson expands, plus Medicaid and all the other things that come in 1965. So, I mean... That, that that debate is already starting amazingly as early as the election of Goldwater in 64, but it's not Goldwater who makes the case, it's Reagan mm -hmm. who makes the case in a time for choosing. Yeah, mm -hmm. in the time for choosing speech, he, he does say a government bureau is the nearest thing to eternal life we'll ever see on this earth. Mm -hmm. So he knew once created, it wasn't going to go away. Right. So let's... um. Let's talk, we're getting near the end of our time. Let, let's talk about the legacy of the Great Society. Why, why, does, it, why does it matter? Why, what elements of it are still with us today? Uh, who cares about the Great Society? Well, I think it poses some important questions. And I think that these are questions that you know, these teachers can pose to their students because it's, it's relevant in terms of can the government really do anything significant to remedy pervasive social problems? Um, and what is the purpose of government? I mean, this is a question that we continually ask. What, what is the purpose and the function? Uh, and when the government seeks to take on more of a patriarchal responsible role that a citizen can have, uh, where does this place the role of the citizen? So is the citizen stripped of certain responsibilities and obligations to society uh, when the government takes on more responsibility? And not just the citizen, but talk about local um, and establishments such as the church, for example, uh, with poverty. I mean, it was the church's responsibility back at the time of the American founding to care for the needy and the community to care for the needy. And that's, that was societal expectation, but the Great Society New Deal, Great Society moving forward really shifted. Whose responsibility is it? Uh, is it the government's or is it the citizen? Uh, before, before we go on to Greg, you mentioned the church. Did, did churches express skepticism of this? Was there concern that that this is taking away from something that had traditionally been a, 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 an ecclesiastical function? No, I don't think so. I mean, I think in many respects, the um, from what I understand of the Catholic, certainly the Catholic Church was solidly democratic in those days. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so most Catholics would have been certainly New Deal Democrats who would have supported the Great Society. 
labor union members, working class, and even those going to college with a few exceptions who, who join organizations like Young Americans for Freedom because of their anti-communism, believe that the government should involve itself in solving social problems. I mean, this is a social edict going back to, um, I'm going to blank on the Pope, Pope Pius, I think, in the late 19th century or early 20th century. Um, mm. um, and I think yeah. that evangelical churches that aren't really organized politically. So the, the so-called religious right is a decade away. And they would favor a much more individual solution than status solutions, of course. But those people aren't organized in a way, or they're organizing in the 60s, but against the counterculture and against the second revolution and against the immorality they see of the 60s generation, not specifically against government yet. So I would say religion probably doesn't have much of a problem with what Johnson's doing. There's not, it's not a war on religion. It's not even taking away the responsibilities. It might be adding to the sense that of the mission of Christ, that you have to solve the problems of people on earth. You know, you have to address yourself to solve the problems of poverty. And this is what a, a good Christian should do. Almost like the social gospel, you know, emphasized in a progressive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Abby Lynn? Oh yeah, well, I think you, your question is great looking at today specifically and what does the church do today and i don't have any empirical evidence to back this up but i would make an argument that the church probably does the evangelical church probably does less uh today because the government does more and this is just you know over time has, has shifted and changed um but yeah i think back in the, in the time it wasn't probably as much of a a, a problem uh, but today, definitely, I think that uh, the church is, it can't compete with the federal government in terms mm -hmm. of numbers. Churches are, you know, trying to keep their doors open. So how can they funnel, you know, their funds toward, toward the poor, which the church is called to do. But. Hmm. So the Great Society, uh, a, a noble experiment that went wrong, uh, was it uh, ill-fated from, from the start? Uh, help me understand what what happened to the what happened to the Great Society and why. I think you have to separate some of its threads. So I think obviously nobody would say that the civil rights, voting rights, the emphasis placed on racial equality was, um, unless you were a, a Klansman in the mid '60s, mm -hmm. was a problem. Right? I mean, this was this was necessary to redress the problems that developed from slavery and segregation. The and controversial, of course, no doubt. I'm not trying to separate, I'm not saying to say that this was easy because it wasn't, but this is the great one of the great achievements. And I don't think historians of any bent politically would argue against that. Oh, yes, it was better to have segregation. Um, I don't, I don't think there's a historian writing today who would make that argument. The war on poverty, uh, much more controversial because of its em emphasis on state based solutions, as Abby Lynn said, and divorcing it from the local. Uh, areas and the expansion of entitlement programs, which become then bureaucratized. And you had a moment in the 90s with Bill Clinton and the Republican Congress passing welfare reform. But I guess because of the Great Recession, we're back to the levels of welfare recipients we were that, you know, existed before that reform in the 90s. Um, the rest of the programs, some of them too quickly conceived and put together. I mean, the estimates for what Medicare and Medicaid are cost will cost mm -hmm. the country are just absurd. Something like $8 billion by 1990. It's almost 10 times that much uh, by that point. Um, certainly the federal involvement in education has led to problems, I think. Elementary and Secondary Education Act and all its attendant reforms um, certainly has made education much more expensive. Uh, not necessarily better. Um, college loan programs, while allowing lots of people to go to college, we know what the problems are with that today uh, in many ways with the cost of going to college. I mean, Reagan says in his time for choosing speech that we could have sent people to Harvard uh, half the cost of what they were spending on vocational training programs. So, I mean, it probably is still the same, or still something like 50 or 60 job training programs funded by the federal government. It's, it's ridiculous. I mean, there are some things that the Great Society does which are very valuable, and we're living more with the legacy of the Great Society than we are with the New Deal, arguably, because the only two major New Deal programs really still around are 
Social Security and the FDIC, really. I mean, with a few other exceptions here and there, but the Great Society. Wages and hours. Yeah, wages and hours legislation. Effort. But I mean, in terms of the Great Society's fundamental, you know, costs and over time have been tens of trillions of dollars. And poverty has rates haven't been much. Yeah, I'll, I'll just quickly add uh, to what Greg mentioned in terms of the civil rights legislation. I, I don't think that obviously that's something that could have been dealt with and handled at the local level and had to be handled at the federal level uh, in order to enact that type of, of change. And so I think that was a very positive, uh, positive legacy. Uh, the Great Society was the passage of the Civil Rights Act, which just couldn't have been done without the federal government. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, very briefly, we have a, an audience of uh, about 30 uh, out there, and uh, I think probably most, if not all, are, uh, uh, are, are teachers. Um, can you give a, a quick pitch for why they should squeeze into their busy curriculum uh, a, a, a discussion of the Great Society speech in their, in their history classes? Um, the speech itself? Yeah. Or just the, the discussion of the Great Society as a whole? Go with it in any way you, any way you choose. Well, I mean, I think the I, I think the speech is worth reading because it shows this kind of optimism about that Johnson had about the future and about how government could solve problems. And that in itself is worth reading in a sense of how we fundamentally view government differently today. Um, certainly, there are the current Democrats running for president view it in the same way that Johnson does, but. To me, it seems more cynical. There's not this kind of sunny optimism. It's we're, we're going to provide for you. Johnson's not saying that so much. We're going to provide opportunity. I mean, this is very much in vain with what the New Deal was selling too in the 1930s, that you'll have the opportunity and you'll be secure because of what we're going to provide for you so that you can do what you achieve and what, what you want to achieve in life. And you're not going to be blocked by that. Um, that's important. I think it sets the stage very clearly for at least this combated period when you pose it with Reagan between the development of how liberalism goes after the Great Society and how conservatism develops too. Okay. Evelyn. Yeah, I, I also agree with that. And helping your students, uh, again, ask the question, uh, what, what are the responsibilities and even what are the limits of government? Um, what government, I think White House, the White House aide Joseph Califano, who worked under Johnson, even admitted that we did not recognize government to not do it all. Um, and so, but looking back on this, yes, this is filled with optimism. Um, and there are things that we can do as citizens, but what what is the responsibility of government? Uh, and what is the role of a citizen and what are we called to do and how can we fulfill those obligations uh, in our respective roles? And so I, I just, again, go back to how, how can we as a citizen um, help those who are, is, is it possible for us to, to do that on our own without any direction uh, of the government programming? Um, but we're such an individualistic society now. We're not as communal uh, as we were in the past. But that's something to, to think about and your students uh, to think about um, in terms of what, what they can do themselves and what role they have. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, both of our panelists, Greg and Abby Lynn, uh, for uh, this uh, enlightening conversation. And as a reminder to all of you out there, you'll be receiving an email within the next week. That email will include a link if you want a certificate of participation. All you need to do is click on that link. Uh, there will also be in that email to the archived webinar. We do hope that you will share that with your colleagues and also share it on social media. If you have enjoyed this evening's webinar, I hope you'll consider taking an online graduate course in our Master of Arts in American History and Government program. Both Greg and Abby Lynn teach in that program. I am the chair of that program, so I'm a, uh, I have a, a special interest in that. Uh, you can find more information about online course offerings, as well as all sorts of other resources for teachers at teachingamericanhistory.org. 
Tonight's webinar is the final edition of Documents in Detail for 2018-19. We now begin our summer hiatus, as many of you will also be doing. Uh, we will be returning on Wednesday, September 25th. Our discussion at that time will be Federalist 1. We don't even know who the lineup is going to be yet for next season. We know the documents, but we don't know who we're, who's going to be, who the discussants will be. But I hope that uh, you'll have a terrific summer and that you will all be back to join us on September 25th to talk about Federalist 1. So once again, thank you to all of you and have a fantastic summer.